so tonight we're going to talk about just some basic nutrition stuff that you need to be aware of because what you want to do is you want to start eating food and if you can't read the label if you don't have any idea about what food is uh, if you think that the grocery store sells only food uh, you're in trouble so we're going to try to dispel some of the myths and give you some of the information that you need uh, if you remember last time <clears throat> I have eight pillars of uh, health and we talked about I think five or six of them last time um, we talked about the air the water uh, uh, and love I guess we talked about I guess that's the only ones we talked about um, we talked to, okay a little bit about exercise so tonight we're talking about uh, nutrition and we may if we have enough time uh, talk a little bit about calories so uh, food ingredients um, this is a really good website this is the website that I use uh, the most often um, nutritiondata.com and they um, you uh, let's see if it doesn't didn't exactly show it there but there's a place uh, where on on this page that will have um, uh, your search bar where you enter what food you want to look at and then you come up with a sheet like this so uh, so this is for broccoli the first thing that you can do is you, it'll give you the option of the serving size that you want to look up uh, whether you want a teaspoon a tablespoon a gram a whole chicken a, a leg or you know all, all sorts of choices there and when you change this it automatically changes the whole sheet the, so that what you're seeing is what you're getting for that amount so this is for one cup of broccoli so the first thing that you see is the serving size and so that's uh, 71 grams and it, it uh, as you're using my fitness pal which is the app that we use to figure um, your um, your daily caloric distribution um, <clears throat> it's really easy if you figure things in uh, grams rather than ounces they're they're just easier and if you have something like uh, if you're going to use almond butter and if you figure out the nutrition uh, in one gram of almond butter then what I do is I set my jar of almond butter on the scale I weigh it I eat what I'm going to eat put it back on the scale and I weigh it and I know that I ate you know uh, 15 grams then my in my uh, my fitness pal it has uh, my serving size for almond butter is one gram so I just put in that I had 15 servings and it makes it really easy that way rather than each time trying to divide up and figure out you know what uh, you know what part of you know well I had a hundred grams I had 50 grams that means a half half you know it's just it's easier if you do it that way so then it gives you the calories and it you know has your your typical breakdown for uh, for what's in it this is kind of an interesting chart in that <clears throat> this is called um, your uh, fullness factor and so this the scale going this way is more filling the uh, going this way is more nutritious and as we go through some of these uh, you'll see that they change but because broccoli has a lot of fiber in it it's it's uh, more filling and because it's got a lot of nutrition it's more nutritious so the things that the foods that are the best of course are the ones that are up here in the green <laughs> and um, as you know depending on what it is you know so you're going to find some that are very nutritious but aren't very filling and so that's just kind of an interesting um, way to do it then this uh, chart uh, divides it up as to carbohydrates fats and proteins and uh, 
so that's you know that that's kind of good if you're looking up a food you're not sure you know if it's a mixture like beans or something like that you can see uh, where it falls and so you can tell it if you're on a low carb diet then you're going to want to stay you know out of this zone here and you're going to be more over in this area here the interesting thing to notice about this we're talking about broccoli and it's got 26 percent protein now nobody would ever put broccoli in a protein list of foods and the reason is this little chart right down here this has protein quality but if you look at like a piece of you know uh, a food label um, food, uh, let's see let's see what this one does protein two grams you see it that, because this part measures actual protein but what are proteins made up of amino acids and vegetables have a lot of amino acids they have very little protein so you see two grams of um, protein but yet 26 percent over here and because in this chart they count amino acids and so as we go through some of these foods you'll see that there's a big difference in our concept of what a, uh, uh, a good protein containing uh, food uh, is and so if you look down here this is the amino acid score now so remember broccoli has an amino acid score of 72 and if you these are the essential amino acids in this little fan shaped diagram here and if you look it's got the maximum amount in all of them but two who knew you know and as you'll see meat has the same sort of thing it, it but it's not missing those two but other than that this has as many amino acids in it as does um, uh, meat yeah 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 and we have uh, in all the rooms we have that chart that uh, you can take that shows the it's got the good 15 and the bad 15 you know of what, what you should buy organic and what you shouldn't then this chart um, has the nutrient balance and these are the essential vitamins and minerals that you need and it it if it goes all the way out that means that it can meet your daily uh, requirement and so you can see that not only does it have a lot of protein it's got a lot of nutrients in it so this is a really and I, I didn't show this is the first part of it if you scroll on down it will actually break out each one of these things and it'll also show the fats and it'll show just everything that's in it, it it's got a really complete uh, work up here. It's got more stuff to know about broccoli than you really want to know. Grow broccoli and not tomatoes. There you go. Okay. So that's, um, so uh, this is uh, celery. Celery? And look at the amino acids that celery has. Look at the nutrients that celery has. Celery is, you know, very filling and very nutritious. It's, it uh, has a lot of uh, carbohydrates in it and, um, and this is for um, uh, uh, 110 grams uh, so that's a, a little more than a cup uh, full so uh, even celery has you can you can see that it's missing a few more uh, 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 grams of the amino acids but still you know is uh, not a bad uh, um, a vegetable to eat so that when people say they're going to be a vegetarian but where are you going to get your protein vegetables are full of it mm -hmm. so it's just when uh, when things got started you know the beef industry was very powerful and they didn't want anybody to count anything as uh, proteins but what was in meat 
and so thus amino acids, you know, got no credit at all. But you can't um, you can't absorb proteins into your body. Proteins, if you get proteins in your body, they will cause an allergic reaction, and and that's how you become, you know, uh, allergic. Uh, to um, to things and and those are really bad allergies. So this is chicken. <clears throat> so you see, chicken is pretty filling and it's pretty nutritious. Not as good as broccoli. This is one ounce, and you can see you've got your breakdown of calories, fats, uh, carbohydrates zero, protein six grams, and you see. It's got 51% um, percent protein, and what did broccoli have? 26. So broccoli's uh, not so bad after all. But if you look at the, the vitamins, um, it's not nearly as wholesome as your vegetables for the vitamins. Minerals, it does pretty good on. But uh, vitamins not so good, and of course it's got all of the uh, the amino acids. Uh, this is uh, beef, and the beef is pretty much the same. You can see it's got 53% protein, a uh, few more minerals in it, um, and uh, all of the amino uh, all of the amino acids. Uh, this is lettuce. Lettuce? Give me a break. But lo look at the vitamins and minerals that are in lettuce. And the amino acids. And even lettuce has 18% uh, protein in it. Would, would leafy lettuce be much we, it would be more. I think... Um, I think I have, uh, no I don't, uh, I, I used to have spinach in, uh, and sp uh, spinach actually has a complete profile and really has um, a good profile as far as the uh, nutrient uh, balance in it also. So the, the, uh, your romaine, kale, uh, uh, Swiss chard, collard greens, things like that are uh, even better than this. So, okay, so uh, the next thing is how to read uh, a food uh, label, and this is getting trickier and trickier. So uh, there is a new label, <clears throat> and um, uh, this, uh, so this is showing the old label and the new label. The first thing that you want to do is to see what the serving size is because, uh, and I'll show you a couple of really good examples uh, where, you know, they'll say the, the serving size is, um, well, uh, I'm going to show you one for ice cream, you know, uh, a, a pint of Ben and Jerry's is four servings. Now, if you served somebody a quarter of a pint of ice cream, they'd say, the poor people must be going bankrupt or something, <laughs> you know, not serving any ice cream at all. So, so that's very important. And this is also important because if uh, when you're reading mayonnaise, uh, you'll see that their serving size is a tablespoon. Because if in a tablespoon, if you have less than um, uh, five grams of trans fats, you can put zero on the label. But in, in the serving size. So if they put two tablespoons full, then they would have to put the fact that they have trans fats in there. So there's all kinds of tricks like that. That, <clears throat> that you have to become aware of. So uh, this is uh, two-thirds of a cup, 
And again, it's, uh, I, I use the grams more than I use uh, uh, the cup size. And then it has your calories, tells you how many of the calories are from fat. Uh, the carbohydrates. Now one of the things that there is disagreement about, uh, some people say that uh, you have to go by the total carbohydrate, but the four grams of dietary fiber is counted in the carbohydrates. So I always deduct that because you don't uh, digest the fiber yourself. The bacteria that we were talking about before are uh, what digest the fiber and you don't absorb those. The, uh, the cells that line your intestinal tract absorb those uh, digestive products and, and so I don't count those. So that would, uh, that would make a difference. And sometimes you'll see that uh, like if you uh, if you're looking at a, a fiber product, you'll see that it'll say you know, 27 grams of carbohydrate, 27 grams of uh, 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 dietary fiber, so that you know that everything that you're getting is going to be fiber and it's not going to count towards your daily carbohydrate uh, load. The difference <clears throat> between the two is that this one has. Uh, uh, includes 10 grams of added sugars and that's new and they, they just uh, passed that so that now you know if they've added uh, sugar because from here uh, you know uh, you can't really tell what it is and if it's a complex uh, sugar then they can count that as part of the carbohydrate and this uh, shows that uh, they've added the uh, 10 grams of uh, sugar. So this is Ben and Jerry's and so you see that uh, it's a half a cup. That's not even two spoons full. <laughs> Give me a break, you know. And so you know, you'll. Uh, my wife has several times come home with things that she says, "Oh, this is really good," and I'll look at it and I'll say, "Well, yeah, the serving size is, you know, it's about that big, you know, and uh, if you eat, uh, you know, a, a tablespoonful of it, you've got about 300 calories." So, um, so it's it's always important uh, to uh, uh, to read that, and so <clears throat> here's a good example. Uh, your total carbohydrate is 28 grams. You've only got one gram of fiber, so uh, you're going to be getting uh, 27 grams of carbohydrate uh, that that's going to count towards your daily uh, carbohydrate uh, uh, allowance. Uh, Potato chips, 17 potato chips. Right, yeah. <laughs> they, <clears throat> they're going to give the guy that does that the Guinness Book of World Records, you know, for he was only able to eat 17 potato chips. And, and, if you, and, and it, you say 17 potato chips, and that's 160 calories. Well, I mean, you know, my three-year-old granddaughter could, you know, eat, you know, four servings of, <laughs> of that, you know. So, um, so you have to really be uh, be careful about that. Now, uh, this is one of my favorite foods. Uh, this is um, Arroway oatmeal cookies. Forty-two ingredients. Now. I, I could challenge anybody, make me a cookie that has 42 ingredients in it, you know. You, you just, I mean, who, who could, you know, come up with a recipe like that? And the other thing that I can guarantee you is, is that this is probably the first time that all 42 of these ingredients have been added together in one cookie. So you're eating a totally new experimental cookie. 
that nobody before has ever tried. And so that's the problem with with a lot of the foods. I mean, this one does have some things in it that, that you shouldn't be eating. But you, you, the, the health food store, you, when I first started eating healthier, you could go into the health food store and pretty much take anything off the shelf and it would be okay. Not so anymore because they've learned to combine a lot of things and make it look like it's uh, really healthy. But if it's got 42 ingredients, you know, my limit, is, I try to stay at six or under. I mean, that's what most of the stuff that you cook in your kitchen would be, would be uh, six ingredients. And so I think that's a, a, a good uh, number. You know, and there are exceptions. There, there are recipes that call for uh, more things. But... Um, uh, that's uh, that's a good um, uh, a good place to start, I think. So a few things about taste. Uh, <clears throat> there, we're now getting some uh, new information about these areas. They're not so sure that these areas really exist, but they're sure about the taste. You're you're able. These are the only. Uh, and this one is umami, which is a savory taste. Um, uh, and then the bitter, sour, salty, and, and sweet. And the thing that's important about uh, taste is that <clears throat> if you're... Um, when, when you put some food up into your mouth, you smell it. You have, this is the only place where the brain is actually exposed. Uh, the, the nerves go, grow directly off of the brain. And, um, and so the vast majority of what you think is taste is really smell. People who have lost their sense of smell have a whole lot more trouble than people who have lost their sense of taste. And so it connects directly to the brain and then there are some connections from your tongue that go through the nerve also into the brain stem. And so these then trigger different um, uh, hormone productions and nerve uh, transmissions into the brain to make you feel like you've had something to eat. So a lot of uh, the, uh, feeling Satiety is what we call it. Satiety is um, uh, a function of smell, taste, and the feeling in your stomach and, uh, and the hormones produced uh, therein. So the idea is to give yourself um, a chance to let these sensations get to the brain before you finished your whole meal you know and that's why you know sitting down eating at the table you know taking your time chewing your food uh, makes uh, such a difference and um, I guess it's let me see the next slide well that's sort of the same Thing. Oh, this is just a better slide showing this is the olfactory nerve comes directly off the brain and um, is in the um, uh, upper portion of the nasopharynx and that's where um, the, the uh, molecules from the uh, food actually um, stimulate the nerves and make you feel uh, uh, full. And the... <clears throat> One of the things, it, it takes uh, about 20 minutes for all of the hormones to be activated in, uh, the, uh, in this, um, if we go back to, to this, in order to stimulate the, the, um, uh, the uh, olfactory nerve for the, uh, the taste buds to be stimulated for the hormones and the, the nerve endings to uh, stimulate the, um, the brain. All of that takes about 20 minutes. 
The other thing is, is that about tw uh, 20 minutes after you begin to eat, <clears throat> your stomach will have secreted about one quart of digestive juices. So that will give you the sensation of fullness. And that causes secretions of uh, two other hormones, which have to do with making you feel full. And that's why a lot of people will recommend that you sit down and you have a salad first or a small bowl of soup first. You know, give yourself a chance to get those ingested and then, you know, sit down and have your, your then serve your main course and you'll end up eating less uh, than if you, you know, just rush right into it. I mean, I know that you've seen people finish their whole meal in less than 20 minutes. And, so then you don't give yourself a chance, and so then you go back for seconds. Some people can eat seconds in 20 minutes, and so you don't uh, you don't want to uh, to do that. So um, <clears throat> oh yeah, so this is uh, where it says that uh, you, you're uh, 20 minutes for the stomach message to reach the brain, and then the fluid in the stomach. Uh, you'll secrete about a quart of the digestive juices. Uh, the stomach usually holds about a quart and a half. And uh, so that's room for your food, room for your digestive juices. And it's important to, to realize that if you, uh, <clears throat> uh, if you put food in your mouth, you're going to secrete the quart of digestive juices no matter how much the food, there's not a relationship between how much you eat and how much digestive juices uh, you secrete. So when you get, so you, about 10 o'clock, you think, well, I'm going to have just a couple of bites of ice cream and a cookie, and then I'm going to go to bed. Well, you're going to go to bed and lay down with a quart of digestive juices in your stomach. And then you're laying flat with this load of fluid and you get regurgitation and you say, I wonder why I've got heartburn. But you've got all of this stuff trying to push up into the esophagus. So the easy answer for GERD is that you don't eat before bedtime. And again, we go back to <clears throat> that's why we're doing, that's one of the reasons why you do the uh, eight hours of eating, 16 hours of fasting, and you want that your last food to be a while before bedtime. And a, and a while uh, <clears throat> would mean that carbohydrates stay in your stomach four to six hours, fats and proteins stay in your stomach for six to eight hours. So you have to think about that when you're thinking about uh, your, your bedtime. You had a question? Um, I mean, that's, that's a lot. How big is your stomach? Oh, your, your stomach easily holds a quart. Yeah, it'll hold probably two quarts. And so if you don't drink enough water, is your stomach not able to create a quart of digestive fluids? No, no, these all come from your, from your body, yeah. Like I don't eat, I, I don't drink with my meal. Uh, I'm, I don't, I've never seen any really hard science to say that that is right. Uh, but I just, I don't. Maybe it's because I can eat more <laughs> if I don't drink the water. But, uh, <clears throat> but um, no, you don't have to drink water with your meal. One of the things to be on the uh, uh, watch for is meat glue. Um, you want to look at the cut of meat, and most of the time you can you can tell if the striations in the meat aren't the same. Uh, then what they've done is they've taken bits and pieces of uh, other cuts that are left over and they put them in these molds and pour in glue. Oh. And <laughs> uh, no, no, it's sold. They can sell it. If it, if it all comes from a, a steak or something, they can then sell it as prime beef. 
and um, so and I noticed that uh, in a roast, yeah. Because mm -hmm. sometimes I see roasts that have yeah. 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 So that's they've been glued together. Yeah, and I just noticed. Um, I can't remember where I was, but I ha I ordered uh, something with chicken, and um, it uh, the white meat didn't look like uh, anything I'd ever seen before, and I think that they had uh, glued it together, and it. You know, usually you can kind of, if you're getting a big piece of chicken, it it has kind of a shape to it. This didn't have the same shape, and I, uh, I'm sort of dissecting it away. <laughs> My wife is like, George, what are you doing? And I, well, this meat looks funny, and sure enough, the fibers didn't all go the same direction. So, I'm pretty sure. Oh, I don't know. Uh, you know, it it's. <clears throat> What do they call that? Um, yeah. Rhino. Yeah. <laughs> no, rhino. It's probably rhino glue. Not really, but, uh, you know. It's something that would withstand the cooking. So even if you buy, like, organic or grass-fed beef, it still have that? Now, oh, that I don't know about. Okay. That I don't know about. They're, they're, you know, they're certainly not forthcoming with, uh, you know, the way they do it and how they do it and what they do it to. Yeah. So, so uh, we talked about reading labels. Bitters, bitters are an interesting thing. If you're trying to lose weight, you can buy at the health food store bitters, and bitters uh, will stimulate your tongue and send the message to your brain. And if you'll wait just a few minutes, um, then uh, the message will go out that you've had something and you'll be, your satiety impulses will kick in and you won't be hungry again. And so that's, that's uh, one thing to do. Uh, <clears throat> the other, there have been some studies done on smell and people who were... Uh, were hungry and they went in to get a snack and half of them were just allowed to smell it and the others actually took the snack and then they did um, uh, some uh, testing on satiety and the ones that smelled it uh, were 75% 75, 75 of them were just as satisfied as if they had eaten it. So you, uh, you can uh, try that. Um, <clears throat> we've talked about the time of eating. Uh, oh, um, and I, uh, when we were talking about kimchi, I didn't, uh, I, and I really haven't said too much about this, probably should put this, it makes a great soup. And all you have to do is some uh, uh, chicken broth and put some of the kimchi in it, uh, heat it up, and it really makes a great soup. Uh, if you if you did it uh, uh, if you heated it up really hot it would but bacteria are pretty good up to about 160 okay so uh, isn't that a beautiful young lady I mean she's just I think one of the greatest kids uh, she uh, works for the Center of Science in the uh, Public Interest. Uh, she's her chief science officer. She's responsible for the food label. She's responsible for getting uh, uh, junk food out of uh, schools. She got soda out of schools. And her name happens to be Margot Wu Tan. Dr. Wu used to talk about her a lot. Yeah. That's my daughter. That's my daughter. Yeah. And uh, if, have you ever seen uh, the movie Super Size Me? Uh, this is the guy that ate at McDonald's for 30 days in a row and um, uh, almost died. And uh, he, uh, he put on like 30 or 40 pounds. His blood pressure went up. He developed heart arrhythmias. Cholesterol went up and uh, was really in bad uh, shape. She was in that movie. They asked her to make some comments. And the, an interesting thing about that movie, everybody says, well, that's stupid. Who would eat at McDonald's, you know, 30 days in a row? But think about this. 
I've got a new substance <clears throat> that I want to put on the market as an artificial sugar. And so I would go to the FDA, I get my paperwork, I fill out my paperwork, and um, so now I've got to test it, right? So I'm going to test it on some rats. And how do I test it on the rats? I, I give them a rat-sized dose every day for the life of the rat? No. You give them a whole bunch, and if they don't do well, you fail. Voila. So how safe is it to eat at McDonald's? You see, we don't really know. I mean, you, you say, well, you know, I only eat there once, you know, or twice uh, a month. But, you know, you, we, don't, we know that if we held McDonald's to the same standard that we would hold a drug to, it would fail. Then would they let you sell that drug if people promised only to eat it twice a week or twice a month or something like that? So when we think about junk food, you know, and things that we know are bad for us, then we say, well, I'm, I'm just going to eat a little bit, you know. Well, I mean, you can sort of get away with it. I mean, people take small doses of arsenic and, and get away with it. Um, so you have to think about it in a, in a different <clears throat> light than, you know, just can I get away with it? What are the long-term consequences? And we don't know. We don't know. So that's my plug. And that gives me a... There? I'm sorry, what? What's the other movie? Oh, this is a Nutrition Action Newsletter. Oh. And it's a great newsletter. This is, um, this is a, um, um, uh, a group that is the wa they, they're the watchdog of the food industry. So, if somebody tries to put out something bad, they uh, they write it up and put it in the newsletter. And it's it's like ten bucks a year. It's a really cheap newsletter, and uh, so it it's uh, it's always got good uh, information. And it, <laughs> right. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about sugar. So uh, to make one teaspoon, and this I couldn't find a picture of a level teaspoon, uh, but one level teaspoon of sugar, it takes one and a half quarts of cane juice to make this teaspoon of sugar. Now. That is a 300% concentration. At 200%, you get brown sugar. And I saw brown sugar, real brown sugar again. For many years, you couldn't find brown sugar. If Those of you that are old enough, you remember, to call for a cup of brown sugar, you went and you got the hammer, you got a chisel, and you'd chisel off a chunk and uh, melt it and, and use it. And then all of a sudden, you could just pour it out of the bag. Well, what they did is they took white sugar and they uh, roasted it so that it uh, became caramelized and sort of brown in color. And uh, they sold it to you for brown sugar. But brown sugar actually has some molasses and um, some, um, uh, vit some minerals. Uh, all the vitamins are gone, but there are some minerals still in it. And at a 100% concentration, that's uh, molasses. And that's what sugar cane looks like. And you can sometimes, I don't know about in Tulsa, but in Florida, um, certain times of the year, we can buy um, cane, uh, sugar cane like that uh, cut, and you can chew on it. It's kind of sweet. It's not very sweet. Yeah. So if you're going to have sugar, it's better have molasses than white sugar? It's better have brown sugar than white sugar? Um, well, it's uh, not really, because this is still in there, and you're still missing a lot of stuff. And I'll show you, uh, I think, the next slide. 
see this uh, this is uh, the nutrient labeling for cane sugar cane I'm sorry cane juice okay this is unprocessed cane juice and you can see it's got sodium potassium B vitamins B1 B2 B3 B6 panathenic acid calcium it's got quite a bit of magnesium got a fair amount of uh, zinc and molybdenum uh, or magnesium in it and I see molybdenum copper it's got a little bit uh, it's got iron got a fair amount of iron ar uh, a little bit of arsenic in it uh, some phosphorus um, so it's it's not a bad uh, uh, you know uh, combination of nutrients and interestingly enough a lot of these are the things that you need to be able to metabolize the sugar and so how much nutrition does sugar have in it and I show this picture and some of you will, uh, when I show this to a younger crowd, they say, what's an airplane doing in there? But you know what that airplane, you know what the airplane's doing there? Uh, flight test? No, the airplane. Yeah. What's that? Japanese zero. Japanese zero. Oh, I so, it's a, so it's a zero. So, uh, you had a question? So, if sugar comes from Because they have to process it, and it, it. And it takes they they take all of the the nutrients out of it. The the vitamins go, and the water go out pretty easy. Then the brown left is the iron, and so they have a way of getting out the iron, and that re, re, removes the rest of the minerals, and you're left with just you know pure carbohydrate. So if you, and if you look at uh, the broccoli we were talking about, you see that you know uh, compared uh, to the cane juice, actually uh, the cane juice had uh, not as much of of things like potassium and phosphorus, but uh, with some of the other things it has about the same amount. So cane juice itself is really not that bad, but. Uh, again, you see this, the amounts uh, here are for the, uh, the cane juice. And so it, you can apply this model to anything that has been uh, refined, whether it's flour or rice or, you know, a lot of, time, a lot of people now are eating gluten-free and so they're eating a lot of flours that are made from sweet potatoes and amaranth and uh, different things, potatoes and things like that, and they say, well, you know, that's all good stuff. But if they've processed it so that it's like a flour, that means they've had to remove a lot of the nutrition. And so you're really not uh, that much better off nutritionally uh, uh, than uh, if you were just, you know, eating uh, the uh, processed uh, foods. Do you cook in the microwave? No. Microwave <clears throat> vegetables cook uh, vegetables. If you cook them in a microwave, you lose. Um, uh, well, let's see. I go the other way. If, if you boil them, you remove. Um, no, let's see. I forget which end I start at. I start at the the microwave. Microwave moves sixty six percent of the vitamins. Steaming removes. Um, 30, uh, no, it's, it's uh, boiling them removes about 90%. Steaming them removes 66%. Microwave, uh, no, I've got it back. Ste steaming is the lowest. Microwave is the 66%, and steaming is 30%. And boiling is 90? And boiling is 90. So, <clears throat> get a hammer, mash it up a little bit, yeah, yeah, so the, you know, steaming and steaming it lightly, you know, so that it's, you know, it's not as hard, like the broccoli is not as hard as the, um, as it is, you know, just raw 
then then you're okay, and you're you're, you're still going to lose some. You won't lose nearly as much of the minerals. You'll lose some of the vitamins because the steam is is hot. So this is to show you one of the reasons why. So how many teaspoons of sugar are in a can of 16 ounce can of soda? What? 12. And if, if, if you get tired of going to the grocery store, they now have a 30 liter size bottle if you can carry it out of this. Right. So it's 12 teaspoons full of sugar per can. And we said it takes how much cane juice to equal one quart? I mean, how, how, how many quarts of cane juice quart per can teaspoon? A quart. So how many quarts of cane juice does it take to make a can of soda? 18. So the metabolic load on your pancreas is the same as if you had drunk 18 quarts of cane juice just for one can of soda. That's why it's so bad. It's just hard. And, and the soda, I can guarantee you, comes with no nutrition. So where does that nutrition come from? And one of the, so the body has a system called triage, which you're kind of familiar with. You know, in a hospital, they tri have a nurse triage in the emergency room. And on, in the army, they have a triage officer. And so you do the worst, you know, first. And in the body, the way the triage system works is that the system that needs it the most gets it. Well, survival would dictate that if you're not, if you don't, uh, you know, absorb this sugar, that may be the last sugar that you get. So the body is going to take care of that can of soda. Then uh, it's got to take it from somewhere. Well, right now you're not bumping into any bacteria or viruses, so the immune system is probably not doing too well. I mean, it's not doing a lot. So we'll take it from the immune system. We'll pay it back, but we're going to take it from the immune system. And how many of you have had the experience of going out on a binge and eating at all the you can eat buffet and you hit the dessert table five or six times and you go home and you end up sick the next day because you also bumped into a bug, your immune system wasn't able to do what it's supposed to do and you get sick. How many kids get sick after Halloween? Mm -hmm. How many kids get an Easter and things like that? So it, it, it makes sense once you understand what you've done to uh, your, your, your body and how uh, sugar is really important and the body does not want to lose any sugar. So it's going to do whatever it needs to be able to absorb and metabolize it and turn it into energy the way that uh, it's uh, supposed to. How does the sugar compare to the corn syrup? The corn syrup is much worse. Because the, um, the, the high fructose corn syrup has a way of getting into your cell bypassing insulin. Oh. And so while it, it, it'll raise your insulin up, but insulin, if you get too much sugar in a cell, the cell will suffer for that and damage will be done. And so if you're dealing with plain sugar, then the insulin receptor will be blocked and the cell won't allow more uh, sugar in. High fructose corn syrup can bypass that. And so it's actually worse. Agave, 
everybody is using a, well I shouldn't say that, a lot of people are using agave because it's natural, it comes from the cactus plant. And what else do we make from the cactus plant that produces agave? Tequila! <laughs> so if you ferment agave, you get tequila. So, um, uh, so uh, yeah, so agave is not, uh, not good. Um, so it's, uh, so sugar is just bad. The other really bad thing about, uh, particularly if, if you have cancer or you're trying to avoid cancer, is that cancer cells, the, the vast, there are a few exceptions, but the vast majority of cancer cells can only metabolize sugar. They cannot, if you are on a ketotic diet, cancer cells cannot uh, use ketones to provide their own energy. And so it's, uh, uh, it's a good way to uh, get rid of cancer cells. So this uh, is just, you know, showing you some different things. And in the Northeast, nobody has a clue what that is. But everybody in Oklahoma knows what OK is. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I'm sure that, uh, you know, some of these things you've uh, never, uh, never tried. And uh, so be willing to, you know, pick, pick something new and, uh, and try it. You know, go to YouTube. Gee, they've got recipes for everything. You know, Pinterest. I love Pinterest. Oh, I just, I, I, I don't go very often because I rarely go that I don't spend two and a half hours just looking at all of the really great ideas and you get get all kinds of ideas and <clears throat> one of the things that um, I ran a um, weight control group uh, for about two years and one of the things that uh, I let them do was uh, each week somebody could give me a recipe that they wanted uh, that they th that they couldn't live without and uh, my challenge was to make it into a healthy recipe. And so sometimes you have to resort to, you know, uh, odd things. But uh, uh, has everybody eaten spaghetti squash? That's a, that's a really great one. This is a great fruit. This is a lohan. Uh, they come from China. They're only uh, in season for a short period of time. But it's a really nice fruit, low carbohydrate, sweet very juicy, really nice. This is uh, bamboo. Bamboo is uh, really uh, a nice addition to soups and things like that. But the grocery stores are doing better and if, you get, if you've tried everything in the grocery store, go to the Asian market, go to the Latino market. Uh, there's a lot of things that, um, that you can uh, try. Now, oh, let's see, I'm gonna take a drink. Now, this is just a, a teaser. Um, <clears throat> Everybody had a colonoscopy? What about a cognoscopy? <laughs> and we're, we're going to start doing cognoscopies here. And <clears throat> we will be able to run a series of tests and tell whether or not you have uh, the signs of developing dementia or Alzheimer's. And we'll, uh, we're, the test will predict it about 20, 15 to 20 years before it actually occurs. And then there's a way to reverse Alzheimer's now. And so we'll start doing that also. Will that include the genome to check for the APOE? Yeah, we, we have been doing that, and we've been telling people that, <clears throat> you know, you have the APOE4, and so you need to be careful about that. And now we, I mean, before we just told people, you know, you got to be careful about the fats and you need to keep your cholesterol down and stuff like that. But now there's a whole lot more that you can do to actually reverse it. And even people with a double 
allele of APOE4 can their um, uh, Alzheimer's can be reversed. So that's our teaser. Uh, <clears throat> so Alzheimer's is now preventable. The guy that has uh, developed this has been a he's a terrific scientist, and he the nice thing about him what doc, a lot of doctors are doing today is when they come across this kind of information, they patent it, yeah. and then nobody can use it. But he's put it uh, out. He's written a book, yeah. and um, uh, he's training uh, doctors to, to do this. So we're going to start uh, doing it. What's his name? Uh, it's <clears throat> uh, Dale B-E-R-K-E-S-E-N. E-S-E-N? E-S-E-N. And the name of the book is The End of Alzheimer's. Okay.